New Thought Media Network. We are a global broadcast network of positive music, media, and entertainment. Inspiring humanity's evolution along the journey of enlightenment and creating a world of love, peace, empowerment, and prosperity for all. New Thought Media Network. Positively inspiring. Hey everybody, it's the New Thought Media Network and uh, it's time for Science of Mind. My name is Tracy Brown and I am so delighted to be able to dive in to the Science of Mind textbook and really talk about what Ernest Holmes wrote and what it means to us. And most importantly, from my perspective, how we can apply it in our lives. One of the things that is so important to me is not only understanding metaphysics, understanding spiritual principle, but also applying it. And so in our time together, what we get to do during this sat this series, Saturday morning, Science of Mind, um, we get to not only talk about and share what is in the textbook and what Ernest Holmes wrote, but we, we can have somewhat of a conversation about it. So I wanna tell you right now, yeah, I'm gonna talk for a little bit. I'm gonna highlight some of the things that I really like in terms of the focus today and what it means to me. But I want you to be putting questions and comments in the chat. I want you to be thinking about how does this apply in my life? Like, when did I use that principle? Because I'm going to come to you a couple of times and ask you what you think or what questions you have. And I'll also be able to see some of your comments in the chat and I can weave in responses to those questions as I am sharing. So this is a two-way experience. What the group of us are doing that are uh, doing these Saturday morning lectures is we are committing to dive a little bit deeper, but also make it make sense, like what it all boils down to. And today I get to focus on the third part of the introduction to the science of mind, and that part in the introduction is titled, What It Does. So we've already looked at the thing itself. What is God? What is spirit? Like really, like what are, what are we dealing with or talking about when we say God or spirit? And uh, last week it was the way it works. How does it work? And, and today it will be what it does. So as spirit is doing the work of expressing, expanding and evolving life, what is it really doing? So if you're following along in the Science of Mind textbook, um, we'll be talking about pages 40 to 50. And even though it's only 10 pages, it is jam packed with information with challenges and with opportunities. So let's dive in. What is spirit doing as it is being life? What is spirit doing as it is being life? Very early, there's a quote in on the first page that I love and I want you to see it as I am speaking it. It is that the divine mind is infinite, but before it can reveal its secrets, it must have an outlet. The divine mind is infinite, but before it can reveal its secrets, it must have an outlet. So right at the beginning of this section, we are reminded that how what it does is it works through designated outlets in order to create life, in order to expand life, in order to evolve life. 
So if you haven't already figured it out, the outlet is you. The outlet is me. The outlet is everything that it creates, that it is able to reveal itself. And I'm not so sure I resonate with the word secrets because I don't think there's any secret once you begin to understand how spiritual law works. But it reveals itself through outlets. It must have an outlet. Otherwise, it's invisible. It's always present, right? All powerful, all knowing, all of that. But it can't reveal that except through an outlet. And each one of us gets to be that outlet. So what it does is it lives in, as, and through us. It lives based on how we apply it, how we align with it, how we express it, how we exemplify it. I mean, how many ways can I say it, right? Spirit is living or expressing itself in us, as us, and mostly through us. So if that makes sense to you, then just like put a Y or a yes in the chat. Like, are you tracking with me? Spirit needs each one of us in order to reveal itself in the physical. Okay, let me say that again. Spirit needs each one of us in order to reveal itself in the physical form, in the physical experience. It doesn't mean that it's not present. It simply means that it cannot project itself except in us, as us, and through us. And in the beginning of this chapter, um, Ernest Holmes does a really good job of reminding us that it's up to us to use it, right? So also on page 40, the very first page of this section, Ernest Holmes says, um, but what we draw from it, we must draw through the channel of our own minds, science of mind and spirit. The science of mind requires us to use our mind, to use mental thought, to use mental capacity in order to determine what we are wanting to experience in order to actually influence and experience that. And so we must draw through the channel of our own minds, whatever it is that we desire or need to draw from the infinite source. And this, this idea is, of course, all throughout the Science of Mind textbook as we understand spiritual principle, right? It can only do for us, through us. And so this chapter is where this foundation is so beautifully laid that we know what spirit is and we know what it can do, but what it actually does is it works through each one of us as an outlet. So just like you're saying good morning to each other in the chat, you are tapping into this energetic that is expressing the presence of spirit, the expressing the presence of love and peace and joy and harmony and wholeness and beauty and art through just connecting with one another. So that's the foundation for these entire 10 pages, that what spirit does, it does through physical outlets and for our conversation today, the physical outlet we each get to focus on is each one of us individually and all of us collectively. I also really love the reminder that is here that everything already exists. Spirit has already create, created everything. It already exists. But what we draw from it, we must draw through the channel of our own minds. And the universe simply says yes. How many times have you heard the phrase, the universe only has one word in its vocabulary, and that word is, say it with me, yes. 
And so what we draw is a yes. What we experience is a yes to our deepest desires, our, our strongest beliefs, or our intentions that we set. But that doesn't mean it's the totality of all existence. So again, the title of this section is what it does. And what it does is it delivers the experience of life through us as us. So take a deep breath because that's, those are very simple words, very simple words, but they're very deep and profound words. And when we take that seriously and then add on everything else that's in this section, it's simple to understand, but not necessarily easy to execute. So going through the, the, the next thing that really stands out in this chapter for me is how much it emphasizes our receptivity, that we must be receptive to the power of spirit. We must be receptive to spiritual law and we must understand spiritual principle and how it works so that we get in alignment with it. Just like we get in alignment with the physical law of gravity. We understand, we don't necessarily know how to create gravity, but we understand how gravity works. And so we work in, or in alignment with gravity when we're young and we're just learning about gravity. And we understand when we throw a ball, it's going to come down somewhere. So we need more force if we want the ball to go further, but we know it's gonna come down to whoever catches it or to hit the ground because of gravity. So we don't know how gravity, we don't know how to make gravity, but we know how it works and we adapt to that so much so that when we walk from point A to point B, we don't even think about gravity, but we know we lift our foot and it comes down. And if we, you know, we are going to always be grounded to the earth because we understand gravity. Spiritual law is no different. When we are learning spiritual law, we have to be conscientious or conscious as we use it. We have to be receptive to understanding how it works. And then we learn to use it to benefit what we are attempting to do in our lives, the intentions that we set. But it begins with being receptive to the fact that there actually is a spiritual law. There actually are spiritual principles and they actually are at work without us doing anything. So as we uncover and discover them, we align ourselves with them to the point where we go through our day and we don't even really think about it consciously, but we are using it consistently. Does that make sense? And Ernest Holmes reminds us that um, the universe is impersonal. It gives a life to all. It is no respecter of persons. So if you're following along in your textbooks, um, that's on page 41 in the second paragraph. And a lot of times I've had people come to classes and they'll say, well, I've heard this phrase that, you know, spirit is um, impersonal and it is no, or it is no respecter of persons. And they'll be like, well, wait, what does that mean? Well, in this introductory section, Ernest Holmes lays that foundation and says uh, that the spirit is impersonal or spiritual law is impersonal. It's going to work the same for you and me. It's going to work the same for anyone who uses it, who, who gets in alignment with it. And in that sense, it's, it's impersonal. It doesn't work one way because someone has the title of minister and work less or differently 
for someone who is uh, from a completely different faith and system and is not a minister. It doesn't work, you know, because it likes Tracy and Tracy, you know, is, is extra special, but it doesn't work for Kate because, you know, Kate's just Kate, right? No, it works the same. It doesn't respect a personality. When I was first learning about this, I substituted the word personality instead of person to help me get the idea that spirit, God, the universe is not a respecter of persons because that was confusing to me. I was like, but wait, spirit created all of us. It, it respects all of us equally. And in the language of, you know, the early 1920s and 30s, and in the language of other spiritual writers, authors, and philosophers, no respecter of persons. Even if we go back to the biblical scripture, there's a similar phrase, right? And so it's not respecting your individual personality, how you are showing up in human form. It's available to everyone equally. So when we remember that, and we remember that spirit is simply looking for an opportunity to express itself through what? Through an outlet. And then we recognize, hey, I am the outlet then it becomes easy to say, oh, everyone is an individualized outlet for the goodness of spirit. And in that sense, everyone who is in alignment with spiritual law is able to um, be that outlet. And that is, that is what spirit does. It works through its outlets. So all of this is scientific and that's like all in the foundational piece. And don't forget, you can put questions and comments in the chat and we'll track them. And in about 10 minutes, I'm going to actually stop and ask if you have specific questions that you'd like me to, to speak to. So don't forget, don't forget that uh, we want this to be a conversation, not just me talking at you. So in the first part of this section about what spirit does, that is, all of this is so important to understand. But then Ernest Holmes goes into this idea that there is a scientific method that can be used that really must be used so that spirit can most effectively work in your life and work through your life into the collective consciousness. So Ernest Holmes says, um, we are surrounded by and immersed in a perfect life, but only as much of this life as we embody will become ours to use, repeating on page 44 in the second paragraph, we are surrounded by and immersed in a perfect life, but only as much of this life as we embody will become ours to use. Now, I love this sentence because it says a whole lot in a few words. First, we are surrounded by and immersed in a perfect life. Get this as life has been created by the creator, it has been created perfectly. Everything that we need is already supplied. All of, you know, often, I, I often, not daily, but often, I am reminding myself that a world that works for everyone is exactly how the world was designed, was created. And the human decisions that we make, the conversations we have, the intentions we set, how we spend our money, where we uh, give of our time, all of that are the decisions we make that either reveal or block 
the world expressing as a world ex that uh, works for everyone. So we're surrounded by, in fact, we are immersed in a perfect life. We may not be experiencing a perfect life because as the second part of the quote reminds us, only as much of this life as we embody will become ours to use. Only as much as we embody gets used, gets displayed, gets demonstrated. And so this is the chapter where in the foundational introduction to the science of mind and spirit, Ernest Holmes kind of lays down the gauntlet in a very nice, sweet, non-confrontational way. We can only experience as much as we embody. Embody does not mean that we think about. Embody does not mean that it's what we uh, like. It means we set an intention and we make decisions and we live our life. We live it in our body by the words we say and the things we do to reflect that part of spirit, that part of life that we believe that we believe in and that we're committed to. And all the rest is still there. It's simply, I'm not embodying it. You're not embodying it. We're not choosing it. So we can use our mental thought, our mental capabilities, our mental and spiritual coin in order to reveal the perfect life. Universal mind contains all knowledge. Ernest Holmes says this on page, um, I don't know, 44 or 45. The universal mind contains all knowledge. And what we, you know, what we get to do, the way it, what it does, the way it works and what it does is it demonstrates that knowledge as to the level that we choose it and that we embody it and that we demonstrate it or are an example of it. Now, he also talks about the scientific method being our discipline and our mental focus in understanding law and love and in using the principles. And of course, that means using our mind, using the way that we think. And on page 45 in the fourth paragraph, Ernest Holmes says, mental work is definite. There's no wishy-washiness in mental work. If you're wishy-washy in your mental work, you're going to get wishy-washy results. If you're fuzzy in your mental declaration or your declaration of what you want and how you intend to live, then you're going to get fuzzy results. So often when our lives are not working the way that we want them to work, it is because we've been indefinite in expressing or even for ourselves choosing what it is we want. And so we get a lot of different things. So mental work is definite and, um, and, and we are able to use our mental capabilities in order to define what it is we choose to embody. And this whole idea of being definite in the work is critical, but it starts with going back to the very basic principle of science of mind and spirit. One of the very basic principles. So let us restate that. Let us restate our principle Ernest Holmes writes on page 46. We are surrounded by an infinite possibility that infinite possibility is goodness, life, law, reason. 
and it is expressing itself through us. In expressing itself through us, it becomes more fully conscious of its own being and it can pass into expression through us only as we consciously allow it to do so. Now, when I read that, I'm reminded, like he's saying the same thing all over again, but with different language. And that's how we learn it and believe it and take it in when we hear it over and over again. Spirit does what it does through us. And we use spiritual mind treatment as one way to clarify that. So let, let me stop. Let me stop for a couple of minutes. One, I want you to breathe it in, take it in. I want you to think of a situation where you've actually seen this work in your life. And while you're thinking about that, maybe uh, let's hear from, uh, let's, let's remind you about our sponsors on the New Thought Media Network. And then I'm going to come back and ask you to put in the chat if you've had an experience where you got it, that spirit can only work through you. Is there an example that you have where spirit works through you? And let's hear a little bit about the New Thought Media Network for a minute, and then we'll come back in and talk to you. The New Thought Media Network is for here for... The New Thought Media Network is here for you. And there is so much great programming happening. So if this is the first uh, program that you have been tapped into, I want you to really connect to the Facebook page. I want you to check notifications so you can see every time that the network goes live, there's prayer throughout the day. There are talk shows from a variety of ministers and practitioners and laity people who are really grounded in spiritual principle. And of course, every Saturday morning, there is this show where seven of us have teamed up together to really bring you information, ideas, and application directly from the Science of Mind textbook. If you joined us late, you can see on the screen, my name is Tracy Brown, and we are talking about the third part of the introduction in the Science of Mind textbook. And this section in the introduction is called What It Does. So what we established in uh, uh, the first few minutes was really that the that spirit is always present it has already created all of life and it does what it does through the outlets that are you and me and everything else that it creates. And we can only experience the allness and of good, the allness of God based on what we can embody, what we choose to embody. So my question was, you know, how has it worked through you? And Terry, thank you. I think spirit works through me when I put together Feel the Flow for the New Thought Media Radio. I always find just the right songs and readings, right? O opening yourself up to what needs to be said, what will serve and what I believe and choosing to do that, Terry, absolutely allows you to embody the goodness of God beyond your own individual thoughts, your own individual um, experiences. And you expand and you also 
uh, help others expand, which I love. And we've got some other examples. Yeah, thanks, Helen. There was a time in my life when I decided, uh, when I desired a career that provided more financial security. Although I was not a licensed practitioner at the time, I used prayer and contemplation to align with God through various people I met. I was able to find a job in IT. Woohoo! Yes, yes. That's how it works. And Helen, I love that you said I was not a re religious science practitioner at that time because I can't emphasize enough that what did Ernest Holmes write? Spirit is no respecter of persons. <laughs> it works for anyone who uses it. You don't have to be a professional practitioner or a licensed or ordained minister for it to work. I was using these principles for more than 20 years before I became a practitioner. It works. So I love it. Let's see what Sue has to say. I love you, love it, and thank you for these examples. I got it. I resisted it. I now embrace it and embody it to the best of my ability and in turning into the new thought media network. Plug, plug, plug. Great, great, great. Of course, you're right here. You know the value of the new thought media network. Before I knew about this medium, I had decided to study the science of my book again and was thinking about how I could get audio support for this. And it came with you guys and Laura Topper and her daily readings. So blessed. Thank you. It's working through me. It works for us, through us. And so that is a great example. And uh, thanks for the plug for New Thought Media Network, because that is exactly why we all are so committed to the success of this network, to reach people where they are, to reach you, to support you. And in that way, we are helping this teaching expand. And that means we're helping spirit expand. Do we have any more examples? Yeah, yeah, you are. Chris, this makes me think of when I finally found a solution, intermittent fasting, to my health issues, keeping open-minded and intending to find a way and then realizing the simplest and most effective solution was right under my nose. It poured into my life, the info and the way, and now I share it to all who will listen. Thank you. Spirit has already created the solution. And what this chapter reminds us is exactly what you all are describing. It works because we create, we allow ourselves to be the outlet. We are receptive to the guidance and we get clear about what we want and the universe delivers it. That's what it does it delivers unto us that which is already available, but we have to be willing to receive it. And thus in the book, Living the Science of Mind, there is a chapter near the end of that book that is focused on receiving, being the receiver. And it is one of the chapters that changed my life. I was reading in the Science of Mind textbook about receiving and found myself reading that chapter. And the key, one of the key points is the cycle of giving is not complete until there has been receiving. So I must allow myself to be a big vessel for receiving from spirit and receiving spirit in as and through me in order to live a life that I love and uh, create, help create a world that works for all. So um, these are some great examples. And what he does in the last third or so of this section is for me really powerful. Now I'm gonna tell you 
something that people who are have been around me a lot already know. All of us tend to have a few science of mind passages that either so significantly changed our lives that we, you know, remember them and live them, or just really, you know, like made the neon lights come on when we were studying at some point, not always at the beginning, but at some point. And so one of my most favorite, there are two, they go together. The first one is about treatment. And Ernest Holmes wrote on page 47, a treatment is a statement in the law embodying the concrete idea of our desires and accompanied by an unqualified faith that the law works for us as we work with it. And uh, the typo is all my fault. The treatment is a statement in the law embodying the concrete idea of our desires and accompanied by an unqualified faith that the law works for us as we work with it. And what is a treatment? If, if you're not familiar with our terminology, a spiritual mind treatment, a treatment of whatever the condition is, a treatment, just like I would go to the doctor and get a treatment for wellness or take a treatment. Uh, I may take my supplements every day because they support my health. A treatment is a process or a use of something in a proactive way to get a condition that I want, right? Which for me, supplements are for wellness and health. Right, a treatment does not always have to be to fix something that's broken. Broken. A treatment is simply a conscious use of spiritual law in order to uh, shift condition. And so we train ourselves to use spiritual laws, to use spiritual principles, to treat our lives, to create treatments that result in a beautiful life, a life I love, a life that works for me. So that's on page 47. And when I combine that with my favorite quote in the entire textbook, well, okay, that's not true. One of my favorite top 10 quotes in the entire textbook on page 49, Ernest Holmes says, hope is a subtle illusion. It is an unconscious compromise. So for me, this wraps up so much. It put, ties it all together with starting out with what does spirit do, right? We know what it is. We know how it works, but what is it doing? It is expressing, it's expanding and evolving life through the outlets, me, you, and it, we are able to do that through training ourselves to think in spiritual law, through doing treatments, and a treatment is definite thought. It reflects our trained mind. It reflects our belief and our faith in what it does, how it works, what it is and how it works. I'm gonna say more about that in just a minute. But on page 49, when Ernest Holmes is talking about treatment, he says, you know, he's just told us in the page before, there's no mystery in truth. It is spiritual law at work. If you believe it, it will deliver unto you because that's what it does. So when I do a treatment, when I feel like I am applying spiritual law, when I choose to believe in and use spiritual principle, I'm not hoping, I am not hoping it works. On page 49, he writes, hope is good. 
it is better than despair. Now, I love that. Hope is good. It is better than despair. But it is a subtle illusion. It is an unconscious compromise. And it has no part in an effective mental treatment. Right above that, right above that, he gives us a setup. And I've, I've been guilty of this. I, so when I read this, I know, yeah, I used to do this. And even today, sometimes, occasionally, I'll catch myself do it. Ernest Holmes sets this up by saying, many people correctly begin their treatment in this manner. I know that the principle of intelligence within me will direct me, blah, 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 blah. Like whatever we say, I know this. I know God works. I know God works for me. I know that the, the, the infinite intelligence is operating, right? We say it and we mean it. Then Ernest Holmes goes on to say, then they complete it, the treatment with the thought. Well, I certainly hope it does. And what Ernest says is, this is entirely forgetting any definite statement and is simply wondering if possibly maybe some good will come along. This is not the correct treatment. It is not a scientific use of this principle. So as we wrap up this chapter, Ernest Holmes reminds us that what it does, what spirit does is it delivers as much as we can receive, as much as we embody. And when we understand that, then we are definitely, right? It's a definite practice. We are definitely being an outlet for the best that spirit has to offer. <clears throat> and it offers it into our individual lives. And as some of you said in your examples of how you know it works, it offers it through the, the lives that we create to serve the rest of humanity. The science of mind and spirit is not a personal well, it is a personal practice and faith, but it's not just to work on individual personalities. It is the same for all of us. And so this idea of we hope it will happen or we hope is very much like Helen asks, you know, can you discuss wishing? I'm thinking about how we use phrases like, you know, best wishes for. So there are two things there. One when we are using our spiritual practice and when we are doing a spiritual treatment, whether it's a formal spiritual mind treatment or we're writing an affirmation, but when we are doing a treatment to uh, create, to co-create a, a life that we want individually or collectively, then we have to understand this is definite. It is guaranteed. Delay is not denial. It's happening. I am sure of it because I know how spiritual law works. I know that the universe is always present. I am clear and I will not be moved from that. That is definite. That's, there is no mystery. So if we, come, if we find ourselves doing spiritual practice, and we hear ourselves saying, using words like hope or wish or maybe, then we haven't gotten clear enough about what we want or we haven't gotten clear about what we truly believe. And we will demonstrate that fuzziness. Now, in the second part of, of the comment from Helen, you know, what about when we use phrases like best wishes? So in a human conversation in a human setting, there are certain things that are part of our socialization. So, you know, have a good day or best wishes, or I wish the best for, you know, you know, happy new year. Hope you have, hope you have a great new year, right? Those are phrases where we are just being on automatic and we are fitting into the socialization. 
And so you'll find your own balance. Now for, you know, in, in another context later in the textbook where we reaffirm the, um, the spiritual principle of pray without ceasing, that everything we say and everything we do actually is a prayer, um, then we might want to think about, woo, is it ever appropriate to use the word hope or wish or I really wish for something? And I think it is when you look at how in English we define the words, but we're not doing spiritual practice. And if we're using, oh, I wish I had a million dollars. Oh, I really wish I had a million dollars, but I don't really believe that's going to happen. That would be the use of wish that is not in alignment with spiritual truth, spiritual principle, or spiritual practice. If I said, I wish I had a million dollars, you know what? If I had a million dollars, I would do this and this and this. I put, I, I make it concrete. I make it real. And I begin to say, not I wish I had a million dollars. I may begin, I may take a step up the ladder and say, when I have a million dollars, this is what I will do. And then after I say that for a while, I go from, I am a millionaire who does this, 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 and this. And so I'm concretizing it. I'm making it more real. I'm making it more believable. I'm affirming what is true. And I will probably never hear my say, myself say again, oh, I wish this. If I say I wish for someone else, you know, I wish you the best. There's nothing wrong with that. We just, we do treatment for best and highest good. But wish is vague, wish does not have power. In fact, wish affirms that it's not true. It might be true later, but it's not true now in our spirit. So that's a really great comment, a really great question. Um, and it brings me really to the close of our time together. And I want to close with two quotes from Ernest Holmes. One is about restating our principle. So again, we're in the introduction and one of the basic principles is, and just take this in, just take this in, like take a deep breath and let the words come into your being. Let us restate our principle. We are surrounded by an infinite possibility. It is goodness. It is life. It is law. It is reason. In expressing itself through us, it becomes more fully conscious of its own being. There's one God. There's one spirit. It lives through us. It expresses through each one of us. And Ernest Holmes ends this chapter with this. Here and now we are surrounded by and immersed in an infinite good. How much of this infinite good is ours? All of it. It. And how much of it may we have to use? As much of it as we can embody. So what does spirit do? What it does is it lives, it expresses in, as, and through each one of us. We can have as much of that goodness as we can embody because it only says yes. My name is Tracy Brown, and I am hoping that you have gone a little bit deeper with me every time I talk about uh, tech, the, the textbook and the wisdom that Ernest Holmes has gathered there, I get 
re-energized. So I hope you too have been re-energized today. I hope that you will join in every Saturday where one or two or three of us from the team will be sharing information and inspiration from the Science of Mind textbook. And finally, I hope that you will find lots of inspiration through all of the programming on the New Thought Media Network. Have a great rest of the day.